Um, so today what we're going to do is we're just going to have a very nice informal chat. I'm going to tell you all the gossip and the stories and the rumors and all the things that you want to know. Because uh, everybody always asks us, like, where do we live and what kind of food do we eat and what does it look like and all that kind of thing. So we thought we'd put this together and, and tell you what it's like to be a crew member on board a cruise ship in whichever department. I mean, obviously we're coming from entertainment um, background and things like that. But uh, yeah, that's what it's about. Yeah, and then we're going to, we have, uh, we've taken some pictures around the ship as well. So we'll show you uh, what the Majestic Princess looks like when you're not in the guest areas. Um, and then as well, we, uh, we have a couple of videos for you to show, and then we'll take your questions as well. So we'll try to answer as much as we can and make it as candid as we can for you. All right, let's jump into it, Lauren. Super. So why don't we start off when we talk about the backgrounds. How did you get here? So I wanted to be a music teacher when I was at school. I studied music. I loved it. It didn't work out for me. Ended up studying graphic design and I hated it, so I was looking for a job. I worked overseas, I did a summer camp in North Carolina when I was 20 and I decided I never wanted to have children because of working in a summer camp. And then when I was uh, 23, I'd, I'd gone home and I was so tired of living with my mother, I decided to join a cruise ship to get as far away as possible and I joined Carnival and I was working on Carnival Cruise Line, which is where that photo was taken. Um, I was a bar waitress and working three and four day track cruising in the Caribbean during spring break. Um, <laughs> ten months later, I did the I will never do another ship again in my life speech. Uh, and, I set, and I kept that pretty successfully for a few years. I worked in the UK, worked at home, uh, that kind of stuff. And then I joined Princess in 2009. Uh, I worked on the Dawn Princess. I was bartender there. And I worked for Princess for five years in the bar department. And then the bar department just wasn't for me anymore. I was tired of making drinks and handing them over instead of making them drinks and drinking them myself. So I thought I'd try entertainment instead. Uh, but Princess has much higher sort of quality than other cruise lines. And you needed to have this thing called experience. And I didn't have any. So I applied to PO Australia and they said, sure, you can, off you go, have fun, no experience, grab a microphone, help yourself. So I did, and I worked for them for, for seven years. Um, I moved up quickly. I was second in charge of the department. I was the deputy cruise director today. So I had a lovely time, and unfortunately, p they were waiting for the transfer of things like the Grand Princess and the Star Princess. They were all gonna, sorry, not the Grand, uh, the Golden, the Star and the Diamond. They were gonna come down and join the p Australia fleet. And at that time, they had a buyer who said, I will take three ships off you right now. Take it or leave it. So they sold three ships. They were left with two and they were still waiting for the delivery of the last of the ships. So a lot of us lost our jobs and uh, Princess very kindly offered to take me back into entertainment. So it only took me 14 years, but I eventually got to where I wanted to be, which is entertainment on Princess. Yay! Yeah. That's me! Yeah, if you don't know, actually, uh, p Australia is one of our sister companies. So yeah. we actually, uh, the way it works is that Carnival Corporation actually owns uh, all of the different, uh, well, it's like 70% of the cruise industry is owned by Carnival Corporation. And then we operate within our own uh, corporate umbrellas. So we operate within Holland American Group, where we have our own uh, CEO and group president. And then on, on Holland America Group, there's us, Seaborn, P&O Australia, Holland America. Yeah, that's, it. that's it, there's the four of us that operate under that brand. So yeah. that's how it works. So it's actually sometimes people can, not this is, doesn't happen very often, uh, more often you see for like uh, technical and bridge department yeah. and stuff like that, they'll, they'll move over to like a PO Australia ship and help them for a little bit if they're short and then move back. But So it is rare, but uh, Christian as well came over from yeah. that. Christian and I actually worked together on PO Australia. Yeah. I used to be his boss. <laughs> he will be again soon, I'm sure. <laughs> All right, uh, yeah, it's funny when it comes to, uh, especially like the, uh, the, the, the cruise directors, assistant cruise directors, because it's not like a home. There's, there's, there's no way to train to do this job. You can't go to college and get a degree on how to talk, right? You either you can do it or you can't. And we all end up here with like a weird mix of backgrounds. Yeah. You know, I mean, Lauren coming through the bar and working her way over. Uh, I was doing the same thing. I, I was studying in university to be a music teacher. That's what I wanted to be. And uh, what happened was is I got a job, uh, a summer job, acting on a pirate ship. So yeah, I know very much like the ones that we saw in Mexico, like yesterday in Cabo. Uh, they're actually almost like, identical to the one you saw in Cabo yesterday, sailing around. And so. Uh, I was acting on that, I was a villain, I had to walk the plank seven times a day, I had to go through. It was a great job, but I, I got that because it was like interactive theater for children. I was like, well, that will help me get into teacher's college. This will help with my application. And then, uh, so I was in university, and after my first year working there, it's only in the summer, 
because water freezes and ships don't do well with ice. So, uh, so we only operate in the summer. And then the uh, the winter came along, and the company called me. I said, "Hey, how do you feel about going to Marine School?" And I went, "What do you mean, go to Marine School? Oh, we want you to captain the ship next year." So I was like, "Yeah, that'd be great." So they actually sent me right away to Marine College, and I uh, got my master's uh, limited, so I could start captaining the vessel. It's a commercial vessel, after all. So I went away, did all that, and then when I came back, I took over the operations of the company. So I was managing, of course, the, the safety of the uh, vessel, the crew, and the guests on board, as well as uh, acting in the show, directing the show, hiring, firing people, training people, drilling, doing the drills. Um, on top you like of drilling people, don't you? Oh, God, Lord, don't start that. <laughs> we, uh, and then we went to, uh, I took over like, a, you know, just day-to-day -day operations, general management. And that's how I found myself in entertainment management. It was a complete accident uh, and did that for about five years. And I was like, I got to a point, and I went, you know what, this is way more fun than teaching. I wonder if I could find an entertainment job like this out in the real world. And uh, so with two courses left in my undergraduate degree, I dropped out of the university. And I, I told my mom this, and she saw her heartbreak. She goes, you, 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 you dropped out of university. And I go, yeah, I go, but don't worry, I have a job lined up. She goes, okay, well, that's good, Kevin. What's the job that you have? I go, well, Mom, I'm going to go to Royal Caribbean. I'm going to become a bingo host. What could go wrong? And she was, you know, I, I, I've, I've been a disappointment before. That, that was a big one. Um, so that lasted very shortly until she found out that uh, family members have very generous cruising discounts. And then she was completely okay with my life decisions after that. Uh, very, very much like Laura and I uh, kind of moved up the ranks really quickly there to what they call an activities manager, which would be second in charge of the department. I uh, spent about five years with them, and then uh, the ships were getting much too big for me. I liked being out and being able to socialize with you and have fun with you, but when the ships have, you know, 6,500 guests, it's not happening anymore. There's too much admin that's behind the scenes. So I uh, resigned from them and came to a company that doesn't have those massive ships, where the, our massive ships are their medium-sized ships. And uh, so I came over to Princess, and that was the best decision I ever made. So I've been here for five years. They, they told me, hey, come over, jump over, try a, a contract as assistant cruise director and learn our product. And then we're looking for cruise directors, and that was it. So I did the one contract on the uh, the old Star Princess, then uh, moved up from there, and yeah, it's been a, a great five years with Princess, and really happy to make that that jump over. All right, so we're gonna go through the whole process now of how you get hired uh, to getting on board. So we're gonna tell you all of the inner inner workings of what it's what it's like for us and how exciting yeah. it is. So you want to work on a cruise ship, Lauren? How do you apply? Well, the first thing the first thing you've got to figure out is which company you want to work for, because. If you don't like children, don't work on Disney. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so you've got to figure out where you want to go. And uh, once you've found out which company you want to work for, the best thing to do is to go online and find out who their registered Manning agents are. Now, there's a lot of scams that go around about working on cruise ships. Sorry, what's a Manning agent? It's, um, oh, sorry. Well, yeah, it's a recruiting agent or a Manning agent. There's a lot of scams that happen, so a lot of times you're going to get told, I can get you a job on a ship, but you've got to pay me 500 bucks. If something like that ever had to come up, if you know somebody who's applying, that is a scam. It's not a real thing. The only way to get a job is to go and look on the internet, find out who their agent is around the world, because there's different agencies around the world that employ on behalf of, and you would send your information and your resume, or as we say, a CV. You'd send your CV, your resume through to the manning agencies around the world, and they will have a look through, and according to whatever the company says they're looking for, uh, department wise etc etc and what experience you need and all the other things that they need they do like a vetting of who they would recommend to the company and then once you've had an interview with the agency first and they've seen you and they're like okay well you know they'll they'll be great for this job then they will forward your information onwards to the to the main company whichever company you're applying for and then they will interview from there and and from that point in time, that's when the ball starts running. So it's it's a bit competitive if you're thinking, you know, these jobs go out around the world. So there's anybody from anywhere in the world can apply for any job at any time. So when something comes up, you grab it and you take it. It's pretty cool. Yeah. All right. Uh, okay, I'm going to have you keep going because someone's keeping trying to page me right now. Cool. Can you believe we still have pagers? How yeah. crazy is that? It's like I'm a 90s drug dealer. It's, it's fantastic. Like <laughs> So, uh, yeah, it's all yeah. the wrong one. But join it, you know, talk about joining documents. All right, let me just put these all up. It's, it's all Oh, different. they're all there together. Okay. They're all, they're all different, yeah. So once you've got the, once you've got the, uh, the interview with head office, um, and they've chatted to you, and they've decided that, okay, you're good, we're going we're gonna to grab you, you know, we want you to come and, and work for us. Um, at that point in time, that's when all the excitement really kicks off. 
and then you start paying for things out of your own pocket. That is the first time you start paying. So they will send you um, a letter of intent saying that we want you to come and work for us and now you need to get your affairs in order. And by affairs in order, I mean the biggest bunch of paperwork you've ever seen in your life, especially if you're coming from South Africa. So you've got to try and get your visa sorted out. Uh, we all work on a C1D, it's a Siemens visa, which allows us access into the state. Uh, you've got to get that going. You've got to get a police clearance certificate. So we've got to prove that we are decent human beings to come and work on a ship. Um, and then of course, you will also get your contract. Now throughout the presentation, you'll hear Kevin me, when we talk about a contract, uh, in your terms, you might think a contract is a piece of paper that you sign, and yes, it is that, but we also refer to our work at sea and our time together as a contract. So this would be, which contract did you work on? We were together on the star, it was that contract, or this is my fifth contract. So it's more like a, a tour of duty, for example. So we get all our paperwork together, all our joining documentation, uh, they let us know where to go, when we're going, um, your medical, you've got to get a full medical done. So if anybody does want to work at sea, you have to be able to pass the medical. There's no restriction really on age, but you have to be medically fit to work on board. So if you can't run up a flight of stairs, you can't work on board because that comes hand in hand with your safety duties. So there's a lot of things that have to happen um, in the background. And now, of course, we get all these COVID tests and swabs and vaccines and all this other nonsense that you guys have to do. We have to do them too. Um, and then we would get a, a, a little letter saying, good, you're joining this ship on this day, be at the airport at this time. And then you get on a plane and off you go, and it's amazing. Uh, Princess is very cool, they pay for our flights, which is wonderful. Um, if you're a crew member on board, all our flights are paid for from the international airport of our departure, our home country, to the ship and back again. Everything gets covered. And in the old days, pre-COVID, we used to spend a night in a hotel. Uh, just before joining, we used to all sort of fly into the airport, we'd go to a hotel, sleep there, and then get up in the morning and then get herded to the ship uh, in the old days. But nowadays, because Princess is trying to restrict how much time we spend traveling and with other people, you know, just in case, they now fly us straight. You join the ship on the day that you land, but you come into the ship and you go straight into a quarantine for seven days. So if anybody's wondering what's happening on deck number nine and why it's closed off like the twilight zone, those are crew members <laughs> who are joining us who are like Kevin's replacement. She's in quarantine at the moment. So those are all crew members right now. We treat it as a red zone. We're treating it like as if they all have COVID. Uh, they're getting food delivered to them. Uh, we've got guys in the full Ghostbusters outfits spraying stuff walking around the ship, you'll see them. Um, and that's purely for, for new crew who are joining. All fully vaccinated, fully boosted, uh, but just in case. And it's fantastic. Quarantine is the best. It's, just, it's the, no, honestly, uh, for, for crew members, because typically you would fly in and then you're right to work. You, like, you know, we, uh, the crew members, you board the ship before you guys even get on. So like while, the, while you're leaving tomorrow, we'll be taking on new joiners that will start in a week from now. And you would come in and you would be at work within two hours. You'd be in a uniform and back to work. Where now you come on board and you have a week to just chill out. And they're all balcony rooms. We give everybody balcony rooms. Um, they, they sit back, they relax. They're allowed to order what we call kambusa. Yep. Do you want to, okay, so, okay, okay, this, <laughs> Sorry, this is going to blow your mind right now, okay? So this, when I left Royal Caribbean and I was coming to Princess, somebody was telling me, they said, hey, uh, you're going to love a couple of things. Uh, one at Princess, which we'll talk about this in a second, uh, compared to that company, is that uh, officers, we get to order off the menu. So like we eat the, literally the exact same menu food as you. And I'm like, what, really? Like, yeah, you want lobster tail, you can have lobster tails. Like, what? And so I thought he was messing with me. He goes, oh, wait till you find out what Cambusa is. Like, What's Cambusa? What's that? You didn't have Cambusa. No, we didn't have Cambusa. No, that wasn't a thing. So Cambusa, what happens is we have cabin stewards as well. And our cabin stewards, uh, once a week, we can uh, they'll give us a little like a uh, hard check. We write down our information on there with our, uh, our uh, account number, number and phone. sign it. And you put it on your door. Then your cabin steward goes down and he does your shopping for you down in the stores in the back. They'll give you like a case of Coke, a bottle of uh, water, or, or you get cases of water. Uh, you can get bottles of vodka, a case of beer. And it's all this, and they deliver it back to your room. I'm like, 
what, the, is that your fingertips? Like that, like, yeah, absolutely. And I came here and I was like, it's real. It's a, it's a cruise ship miracle. So, but uh, up there, same thing, they can order a cambusa. So I know like a lot of the people, you know, all crew members, we end up knowing each other really well. And so they'll sit out on their, their balconies, you know, in the evening or at sail away, and they'll sit there and have a drink together and, and enjoy the sailways, which is something that we just don't get to do. So yeah. Yeah. the, the, the right. quarantine period is actually fantastic. And it helps you adjust your time zone too. Because yeah. a lot of us, we're flying from all over the world. And so, you know, it's, it's a different day when you arrive. It's, a, it's yesterday again. Like I left before I arrived. <laughs> or something, I arrived before I left, I don't know. It was one of those weird things. So it's really cool when you get into quarantine. You know, you, you don't really unpack, but you've got all your stuff. You've got enough for the first week or so. And then you just sit there and you go, I don't need to do anything. This is what it feels like to be a guest. Oh, oh, it's really good. And you take those photos. You know when you have your feet up on the balcony like this? Yes. You know, with the sun setting, you're doing those photos. Like, yeah, I can cruise. Um, the holiday. Yeah, so uh, that's how we get onto the ship. It's always a, a whirlwind. Yeah. Um, did you talk about visas? Uh, briefly, yeah. It's just getting the C1D visa. So it's a bit of a pain. You don't need one. No, he doesn't needs. know the, the, the anxiety. No, it's Canadian. right. Uh, Canadians, we, we're the only com country that's exempt. Uh, we're allowed to come in on like a business visa, like any Canadian, we can, just like the Americans, you go on, you can enter into new business. We come in on that, and then uh, we just get stamped in. Uh, we do one trip on the ship, and then when we come back into port, immigration, they'll change us over to a C1D, and it doesn't cost us any money. Literally, they just stamp your passport, and then you're in. So it's really easy for Canadians, but the only problem with that is that if a cruise director can't join because they have a visa issue, Guess who they're calling? It's the Canadian that's in the middle of their vacation to fly back in early and go back to work. So, you know, it's good and bad. There's some trade-offs for that. All right, so uh, cover that. once when you get to work, uh, there's a lot to learn. The first two weeks, by the way, are crazy, especially for your first contract on a ship. Oh, you should specify what a contract is. I did. Oh, you did. Okay, perfect. The two, the two contracts. Okay. Um, your first night on board is one of the most terrifying things ever. You lay in bed. And you lay there, and every single crew member does the exact same thing. They lay there, look at Val, look at Val right now. What did you do, Val? He cried, Cry. he cried. <laughs> we, <laughs> we all do, you lay there and you go, oh my God, what have I done, right? Because you know, you're away from home, the environment is so different, uh, the work, right? Like, the work. Like you describe it really well, but not knowing where you're going. And, yeah, anyway. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so when you get on board a ship, right? I, when, my experience i had never seen a cruise ship in real life until i got on one to work on it and i joined my first ship was the carnival fascination which still i think had open lifeboats so i remember looking at it going it is so big like i think wow it's enormous now I look at it and i go in lifeboat you know it's tiny but um when you join that first day you have no idea what on earth are you doing with your life at all? Because it's not only that you've got people from different countries, different nationalities. Um, we speak in a whole different language on board. We shorten everything. There's abbreviations, there's slang words for things, there's all that kind of stuff that you have no idea until you get here. And I, you know, you still learn new things every day. Then you've got to find the maze that is the underground area that you guys don't see. I mean, this is already, if you guys can't find a Lego dining room, you should try and look for the hotel stores department to get a uniform. I have no idea. It's madness downstairs. It is an absolute maze. Um, and you, there's no windows. You don't even know if you're going forwards or backwards. You just end up walking around in a circle until somebody stops you and says, are oh, you okay? Um, and then not only that, but you're getting plunged into a job that even though you have experience, you need to have the ship experience of this ship because we all do things differently. So every every job is slightly different. Somebody wants you to do something in a different way, even though you've done it for years and years and years. So you've got to, like when I was a bartender, for example, I know how to make a margarita. I know what goes in a margarita. I bartended for years. But then I had to learn what the princess ingredients were, what the princess glass size were, and you know the measurements and that kind of stuff. So you learn the job again. And then you still have to deal with guests who are asking you questions about where things are on the ship and you standing there going, I don't even know where my cabin is. Like, <laughs> what toilet? I don't know where the toilets are. The theater? I have 
barely found my way to this bar. And you know, you turn me around three times, I'm not gonna be able to find my way back out again. It's really, really hard. Your first your first month on board is the hardest month in the world. You're learning your your whole mindset is completely blown. It goes straight up your learning curve and then eventually you start sort of evening out and then after about three months or four months then you start getting into the rhythm of this lifestyle. It is the hardest thing in the world, but it's so much fun too. Honestly, I'm well. I'm almost six months now here, yeah. and I still get lost in the career. It's like I'm dead. It's it's what Lauren's saying is so true. And then like every day, I'll be like, I don't know. There's a staircase here. Yeah. You know, you go on a career like, where does this go to? And you go up, and all of a sudden, like the staircase through here. Yeah, but you walk I've with someone. I found out by accident the other yeah. day. I, said, well, I didn't know there was a way to get up from there. You walk through with someone, and then somebody goes that way, and you're going, what the hell is this? But now you're trying to look cool, being like, oh yeah, I'm turning around, going, where are we? What is this little place? It's like a Latin cave downstairs. It's wonderful. Yeah, it's so it's, much fun. Yeah, it's huge. I, there's, uh, I'll, I'll show you in a second. We, we do every week, uh, we do uh, what we call crew rounds, where we just do inspections on all the cabins in the sh you know, on the ship for the crew. And uh, I was downstairs doing it once on deck three. And uh, we were there with the clipboard going, okay, where's cabin, you know, 31003. We're at 31001. And I we can't find it anywhere. We're like, where is this? So we take off and we walk around this huge loop and we're going through left to right, left to right, and we come up. But when we were saying that, there was a, a door down with these pair of boots outside. And we walked all the way around, then we came out on the other side, and that was the cabin we were looking for that was like right next door to it. But it had boots. It was, it was the same boots. It was like, how do we end up back at the boots? It was like, it was like it's like Narnia walking yeah, through it. It's, it it's hilarious. All right. So we learned the, uh, we learned the job, but that's actually our secondary job. So on board, everybody's uh, primary job is to our safety duties. Um, it's very much like uh, the flight attendants. You know how your flight attendants, they're there for your safety. And then while they're, because they're there, they're serving you drinks. We're kind of the same thing. We're just waiting for an emergency. And then we Can post we events in the meantime. Light a fire. One of you light a fire. It's like you're waiting for an emergency. But we are. It's, it's all, it's all we're, it's, that's all our primary role is our safety duties. Um, so and everything's kind of based on like what your skills are. So like the uh, assistant cruise directors and cruise directors, we're uh, the first, the officer in charge of a muster station. So if we were ever to have to uh, do the general emergency alarm and muster, uh, actually, if you were in this muster station here, Karen is the leader. So she'd be the one that'd be on the microphone as you come in. All right, everybody, would you just sit here like this and this and this and this? Here's how you put on your life jacket. These are the doors we're going to exit through to these lifeboats. And then they're, they're, we're in charge of all the crew in here to help make sure that we get you in and evacuate and take care of all the situations. Um, you know, so it all kind of depends on your job. They're more relevant to what you do on board. Um, sorry, my brain shut down. My name's Lauren. Your name is Lauren. <laughs> um, yeah, so th that's what we do. And now oh, oh, we're drilled as well. Uh, once a week, every single week we do drills. If you were on, on uh, Mazatlan, we conducted a crew drill that day. So we sound off all the alarms, we do a full simulation, we have smoke machines, we use cast members as casualties, we go all out. And we simulate everything from discovering a fire all the way to abandoning ship. And then also, uh, every single uh, year, we have to do inspections with the Coast Guard. And uh, this turnaround, actually after you get off the ship, we can't bring on the new guests because uh, we have a Coast Guard inspection. So they're going to come on and then there'll be a whole bunch of Coast Guard officers and they'll be walking around watching us carry out our drills and do our exercises to make sure that we're ready to go. And you can fail that and they can stop you from sailing. There's been, if you look it up, there's been cruise ships that have failed it before. The Coast Guard goes, no way, you guys aren't taking people on. And so you see that happen now uh, with uh, other companies. Yeah. So. Yeah. But um, every crew member is trained in their safety duties. It's ongoing. And a lot of them actually do additional things and we have additional certification. Uh, that you wouldn't even think that we'd have. So even though Kevin is in charge of the muster station in, in the Princess Theatre, he also has the ability to drive the lifeboats. And we all do firefighting courses and things like that. So everybody's got a lot of, of extra. It's not just grabbing a microphone and talking. It's, it's a lot of training and, and extra things. And it's a lot of fun, actually. Yeah, I, lo yeah. I love doing Safety the drill. Safety drill, it's fun. But especially, I think, because of the marine training I've had going to marine college, you know, it's been a lot of fun to be able to put that practice in. And, and it happens, emergencies happen at sea. Um, you know, I've been through five fires, three of them that were actually a decent fire. So that's the wrong way to say it, but like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
glad you're leaving now. <laughs> I've had to muster the guests a few times. We had to do it on this ship, actually. Yeah. We had to muster all of our guests for a fake a false alarm man overboard. Thank goodness it was a false alarm, but we had to bring everyone in and make sure that everyone was accounted for before we continue sailing. And that was, of course, at one o'clock in the morning. So, you know, this is, yeah. You know what, though? The guests that saw it all in action gave us the highest ratings ever that we've achieved. No, seriously, because they saw the uh, process and, and happening. Like, they saw all the procedures. And you could see that they had the confidence in the crew going, oh, okay, these guys know what they're doing. The only complaint, well, we didn't get a complaint, but the funniest thing that came out of that was, uh, so obviously if an emergency happens like that, and we're mustering all the guests, is that the guest services shut down. We're, we're taking care of the emergency now. We're not serving you drinks, right? Like the, the, that's just a new priority. But what happened was, is that we've been teaching you so much about the medallion class app that everybody was using Ocean now while they're in their muster stations. And so when the room, uh, the, uh, uh, the bell box. Bell box, the uh, 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 room service. Room service. When those guys got back, they had like 95 orders of coffee and hot chocolate. And they're like, these aren't getting delivered. Like, there's, there's no way we're delivering this. They canceled them all, sent everyone back to bed. It's pretty funny. Okay, uh, average day, there's no average day on board. Everything is always changing. If you like things to be consistent, this is the wrong place for you. I always say it's like, uh, I feel like my job is juggling plates and just try not to let anything fall, right? You're, just, you're constantly in the state of juggling and adapting and adjusting. Um, every day's different. That, that page was because there's nobody down doing carpet bowls right now. I'm like, okay, great. Well, I'm in an event, so thank goodness we have all these assistant cruise directors that we can page. And Karen, you're supposed to be there. Take, take care of it. So, <laughs> and so, I mean, there's always something that's coming up on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, you know, musician with a medical issue that's, that's leaving tomorrow. Yeah. And, you know, like there's just there's stuff like this that's just constantly happening, and uh, we're always adapting and overcoming. But uh, so to kind of break it down simplistically, we have sea days and port days. Uh, we don't know the day of the week, yeah. by the way. All the dates. I do right now because I'm leaving tomorrow. That's the only reason I know what day it is. It is Friday the 28th, right? Yes. That's, it's Friday. I fly out Saturday. That's why I know. Okay. We actually refer to days as like if we were talking like say it was still on. And be like, hey, on this first sea day, let's do this. Or, hey, uh, in Puerto Vallarta, let's do this. That's how we talk to each other. We talk by ports, not by days of the week. Yeah. So, what's a sea day like? So, a sea day is invariably our busiest day as a crew member on board. Now, bear in mind, we have very strict work hours that we have to adhere to. Okay, our maximum hours of work for a day is 14 hours with a 10 hour consecutive rest period. Now, that consecutive rest period can be broken up into two sections. So, it can be uh, no less than six hours and then with a later four hour break or seven hours and three hours, eight hours, two hours, nine hours, one hour. So we have to we have to have at least 10 hours rest in a 24 hour period. However, uh, sometimes on sea days, you do end up working your full 14 hours. Uh, most sea days, I would say we do about 11 or 12 hours is about an average sea day for us. And that is on the floor working. So that doesn't include like going for breakfast or nipping out for a quick cigarette if somebody smokes or having lunch, it's on the floor, physically in front of guests. On a port day, when most of our guests are allowed off, are going off the ship, um, there are two things about a port day. We have a system called in-port manning, which means that we need to have X amount of crew on board at any given time in case there is an emergency, so our firefighting teams, etc., etc., are still on board. And we can still look after the guests who are choosing to stay on board. So if you are IPM on that day, um, because you can't get off the ship anyways, you'll do a normal, like a sea day schedule and entertainment. And if it's not, then we give you what is called a day off, which means the daytime you are off. It doesn't mean that the nighttime you are off. So a day off, you will work six hours, and a normal day, you'll work about 12. So your normal day is my day off, which is kind of cool. Right. I don't know what to do with myself when I get back home though. That's the problem because yes. I'm so used to working. But you just don't know what to do when you stop. It's, it's, it's true, it's true, isn't it? Yeah, yeah so and like that kind of the IPM days, the import many days, that's that's one of our acronyms by the way, IPM. Yeah. Um, it's the same for all the departments, not just entertainment, like uh, the bartenders and stuff, they all have an emergency duty. So there's a skeleton crew, a certain percentage of them to stay on. Those are the ones that are serving you drinks because they have to be on anyway, so they serve drinks and then the rest can get off and enjoy their day. Typically the rotation works, it's like you'll have an import manning day and then you'll have two days off in port. 
So you know, the next port would be in Fort Manning again. Uh, turnaround days, though, are pretty much uh, right off. None of us can get off of Los Angeles. We're all working all the way through. So you're getting everything on and off the ship and getting you on and off. And there's just too much happening for really uh, anyone other than the cast members to get off on that day. So yeah. All right. So that's it in Port Manning. Uh, you talked about rest hours. All right. Life on board. First of all, crew recreation. So we have a guy on board. Uh, his title is uh, the crew welfare coordinator. And uh, his job is pretty much to be the cruise director of the crew. He organizes different events, uh, keeps us all busy. Uh, you know, he organizes, uh, so he will do evening activities for them. Uh, often we'll get involved and we'll host game shows for the crew. Uh, we kind of try to offer the same. We put in, uh, like our production cast, we'll put on production shows just for the crew only to go in at night and watch that. Um, we do uh, tours, shore, uh, shore excursions. Uh, they're either crazy discounted or even free. So, you know, you go swimming with the dolphins, you know, you see your favorite tour is Petra. Yeah, my, my favorite one, I went to Petra in Jordan. I was doing a world cruise on the Dawn Princess and uh, we were lucky enough to go, to go to Petra and that was absolutely incredible. And that cost me like $30, which is nothing for a tour to Petra, with a, it was a full day. Um, so the tours, things like, like I, you guys wouldn't understand it quite as well, but if, when you come from different companies, uh, Princess really looks after their crew behind the scenes a lot better than a lot of other companies do. Uh, and this is one of the things for us, is to have this, uh, to, to be able to have a, a crew recreation area and to have a crew welfare coordinator, somebody who's just there to make sure we have a good time when we have time off. That's, that's pretty special and it, it makes it a, a really nice place to work because we have this ongoing entertainment, which is great. Last Mazel on, we did crew bingo. Uh, but right now, so uh, we have a crew recreation area, but we'll show you pictures of it in a minute, uh, where there's a, a crew bar, so we can go and enjoy a drink after work. And then there's, a, we'll show you all of it. There's a big uh, area. It's a, Florence is yeah. like a town hall, which makes sense, um, which is a, a great area, but that's actually closed right now. So normally we do like crew bingo in there or in the theater. But right now, just because of what the uh, the new variant out, we've, uh, we've heightened what we call our, like our sanitization levels or our outbreak levels as a precautionary measure, so that way we can try to stay on top of it. And so part of that, we're not allowing any crew gatherings, we're actually canceling meetings, stuff like that. So what we did is we did a special crew bingo here in Princess Live. And so we were able to broadcast live into the crew cabins, because this is a TV studio. And so we broadcast live and I hosted bingo for the crew. And we played a couple of games of bingo and just gave some money to them. So then they would call into that phone number there. But we get to have fun with it. Like we, we did. You know, like, like on that night, our senior production manager was here for it, of course, Reese, and uh, I was I was talking to he's just joined the ship. So I was saying on the camera to all of the crew, oh, well, you know, Reese is the most eligible bachelor. He's just come on board. And I go, if you don't know, he's got a, uh, a double bed in his room and a window, which is that's a luxury at sea. Yeah, sure and so I go, I go, so if you're interested in, uh, in Reese, I want you to know his pager number is this. I gave out his pager number to the entire crew. He said he had to turn it off at like two o'clock in the morning because people were, people were still prank phone calling him and paging him. So we, we get to get up there and have our own fun. Yeah, we do. Uh, but we'll show you pictures of all that as well. Uh, there we go, love life. Well, so, so when I left the, uh, the old company before I came here, I was sitting at home and I was watching episodes of The Love Boat, which was a bit of inspiration. I go, okay, well, maybe this is a sign of where I should apply to. And you know, what really inspired me was how much the doctor really had an interest in making sure every female guest was well taken care of over their voyage. And I was like, wow, Princess looks pretty liberal and pretty outgoing, maybe I'll go there. Times have changed, that's now frowned upon. It's actually an easy way to get fired. You're not allowed to fraternize with guests. However, crew. Yeah, go for it. Go for it, go have for it. Have fun. Have fun. So, yeah, I mean, you know, this lifestyle in this area, it's a very, intense it's a very strange place to work this becomes your world this is literally this is your world because you know when the internet goes that's it um and we don't really watch the news we don't have time so we are all very involved in each other's lives and you know your friends and your colleagues and your your people pretty intimately by the end of the contract um you see each other at the very worst of times you see each other doing the very best of times you see them in a good mood, in a bad mood, uh, in every mood that's humanly possible. Uh, you see them first thing in the morning in their pajamas, when they're hungover maybe, or, or not feeling great, or 
you're looking amazing in the formal night. So the relationships that you build on board are particularly intense and they are full on and pretty immediate. So what happens is people fall in love a lot. And by a lot, I mean a lot. Um, not me, because apparently it's not me, but anyway, it happens a lot. And then, then what happens is that you have this massively intense relationship with somebody for about three weeks because it's a, like a year and a half and then they leave and then you're distraught for like two days and then somebody else comes and it's all gone again so it's a it's a roving thing now some people do fall in love and they end up actually marrying somebody or oh, we have a lot of couples on board we have a lot of married couples on board princess is very good with if you are in a relationship with somebody you can link with your partner so and you can also you can do it with friends you can do it with a, a your romantic partner so you would sign, you each sign papers saying that you want to link with this person. So hypothetically, Kevin and I were a couple, we could link, which means that we will be... We're not. We're not. <laughs> we're not. But if we were, we could link and go to the next ship together. And we could join within a month or so of each other and leave within a month. Or so. But we'd have the most of our contract together. The problem with that comes in is that then we'd have to share a cabin because we are now linked. So in the month that Kevin's on the ship and I'm not there, he may, or may not, probably will do, Kevin, um, have a little fling with somebody else, right? <laughs> then I arrive and I hear oh, about they're, it. They're, I heard some <laughs> booze from the audience. Yeah, this is a hypothetical, a hypothetical situation. But let's We're not say. together and I didn't cheat on her. <laughs> <laughs> he cheats on me, right? <laughs> and I arrive now I'm stuck with him for the rest of my contract in the same cabin. That's it. I have to look at the time and I don't want to. So you have to be really smart who you link with. So if you're going to link with someone, you've got to make a good life decision for linking because we get people also, princess, once you've linked with someone and then you unlink, right? They make you wait six months before you link again because we have a pandemic of serial linkaging that happens because there are people who will link with anything. So you need to make up your mind and then sign the paper. But other than that, basically, if you have a double bed and a window, you just, you sort it. You know? More like the, uh, the, the boys that just walked in with the... Uh, oh, hello. We've got our associate Intelli general manager, John, there, and our entertainment director, Duke. And our uh, rooms division manager Constantine. Uh, the two boys in the front, though, they have a suite. They do. They have a living room and a bedroom separate and a bathtub. What's that? You're never in it. Not together. <laughs> but do, you see, do. that's the appeal because somebody else could use your cabin while you're away. While you're away. So John and Duke are not linked. Okay, so yeah. we sorted that one out. All right, let's take you on a tour of the ship. So this is what we call the M1. This is the highway that goes from the front to the back of the ship. Uh, it's for crew only. It's a quick way. That's how we actually get around so fast. And then off the M1, we have actually behind all of your elevators, we have our own elevators there. So we uh, we're able to get around very, very quickly. Um, tomorrow, we don't use this uh, this route. It's actually quite dangerous on a turnaround day because we're uh, we have all the trolleys with your luggage on it. And then as well, all of our stores are coming on, all the food, all the drinks, uh, I mean, like everything, like uh, pens and stuff. Everything. everything, toilet paper. It's all coming on tomorrow, and it's all yeah. being for, uh, craned on and then forklift uh, down these hallways. So you stay away because it's a, it's a dangerous place to be walking around on turnaround day. But that's the M1, so that's how we uh, uh, get around. You see the floor is a little bit different than your hallways. Yeah, so basically, if you open a door and there's linoleum on the floor, turn around and go back. Uh, this is actually uh, a butcher, uh, a butcher room. Yes, yeah, it's it's, it's butchery. butchery on board, um, and as you can see, super clean, super neat um, on board. So we've got different storage areas and uh, food preparation areas according to meats and plants and everything else. And this is the butcher, and as you can see, they're busy uh, getting things ready for the evening and uh, making sure everything's right nice and clean everything's covered everything's tidy the galleys on board 
and I've been through those galleys many times because being by ourselves, we were in the and out the galleys. You can honestly, I kid you not, you can eat off the floor. Not during service because there's a whole bunch of feet coming, but after service, they have to clean that galley down top to bottom. You have never seen anything so clean, and it's actually uh, caused me to lose my job for a few restaurants where I refuse to work when I walked into the kitchen at home and I turn around and I walked out and I said, There's no way I'm working here because I'm used to this kind of quality of clean. It is impeccable. Uh, very cool. Uh, you might be able to answer this for me because I've always yeah. wondered why do all the galleys have UV lights? Honestly, I don't know. Because every galley, when you walk in, there's UV lights at each store. Yeah, it's true. I don't know. No, no idea. What's that? It just helps. Yeah, but like what bacteria would be at the door? I don't know. Oh, by the way, we also have UV uh, air filtration systems in every room now, too. Uh, there's, they're all located backstage, but they come through now. There's a whole new filtration system, too, for the air. And those are on all of our ships now. So that's uh, we had them originally to begin with, but uh, now they have these. Uh, they've installed them to all of our ships, so which is kind of interesting. Um, this is my closet, which I just wanted to show off to you guys. It's, uh, Why is there a man in your closet, Kim? <laughs> Is he trying to get out? <laughs> so obviously a very uh, very full beer fridge there, a beer locker. Oh, uh, it's uh, yeah, Corona. It doesn't sell as good as it used to. Um, it doesn't look like this anymore. You guys have been drinking a lot this week, a lot this week. So pretty empty. Uh, this is a fruit uh, a fruit locker, right? Yeah. Fruit and vegetable. So fruit and veggie locker. So also downstairs. Um, you will notice, well, you wouldn't, you wouldn't notice this, uh, but when you're on board, you'll find all most of our dining areas are at the back of the ship. Um, I always still guess the, the, the ship is designed like I am. The fun's in the front, but the food is right at the back. And unfortunately, the storage area is a little bit lower than I was expecting it to be. So this is down on deck number three and deck number four. Uh, we keep all our food lockers and things are downstairs, the refrigeration areas. Um, and what we do is we would put, like I said earlier, there's a, a room for red meat, there's a room for white meat, there's a room for shellfish, there's a room for normal fish, you know, that kind of thing, to so keep things separate uh, for allergies and cross-contamination purposes. Same thing with our fruit and veggie lockers. We've got all different kinds of things so that happy veggies and fruits that like each other will grow together and sort out each other. Uh, things like tomato and basil, you can keep them t together and they, they keep each other fresh and, and tasty together. Um, other things, apples will make anything um, get a little bit older, faster than you need it to be, so we will keep apples away from the other fruit. Things like that. So all of that is stored downstairs. Um, it all gets palleted in. Everything gets temperature logged and measured to the right things. And then from those areas on deck number three and deck number four, we have food elevators for food only and for food workers only. They will elevate them right up to deck number five where our galleys are. There's also a galley on deck number six, which is why you can't go from Concerto to Vallejo. The galley's in the middle and there's an elevator shaft. That elevator shaft also goes all the way up to deck number 16 uh, to World Fresh Marketplace. And that will be our main hub for delivering of other food stuff towards like the burger bar and, and the crab place and whatever else. So all the food gets stored at the back and everything just sort of runs up those elevators. And hotel stores are kind of kept in the middle of the ship because it's easily accessible for everybody else, and then we use those midship elevators so we're not cross-contaminating with food. Very interesting. As yeah. well, we have to order our food uh, three months in advance. So uh, you have to, they, it's all based on demographics and who's coming on board. It's a, but that's actually somebody's primary job. There's an inventory manager who's just constantly making sure that we have everything we need, right? And I always say, imagine, you know, like on a normal day, you go to the shop and you pick up your stuff, you've even got a shopping list, and then you go home and you're like, oh, look, got the milk you know I, I didn't put it on the list imagine if our hotel inventory manager forgot the toilet paper just once just one small whoopsie you know like oh gotta go back and go get a liter of milk gotta go back and buy another 500 tons of toilet paper it's it's a lot of work we had uh what, we had, i'll talk about the operational pause in a minute but when we had the pause of the sun princess yeah. that's when the world went mad and everybody was hoarding all the toilet paper. Yeah, yeah. And so but we had so much on board, obviously, because we were expecting to have a bunch of guests. So we sent every crew member home with like three rolls of toilet paper just so they'd be safe. That <laughs> parting gift from us to you. Thank you for Here's your bonus for the contract. Take care. Uh, we have our own classroom on board. Well, the classroom has a UV light too. Check that out. Um, 
So that's our learning and development room. We don't actually really use it right now, again, because we're trying to stop everybody from uh, mixing together. Uh, but what we do now is when we have trainings, we actually do them through uh, Microsoft Teams. So we, go, we do them all through our computers and our offices, and we do all our trainings. But then once we get back, we'll get back into that. Uh, lots of trainings, of course. You know, all of like the, the, the food workers, they need to do their uh, US public health uh, trainings and Coast Guard trainings and you know, getting for all of our regulations. But then on top of that, we also get uh, like leadership trainings and uh, as Lauren said, we sign up for additional safety trainings. Um, Cornell. Yeah, so uh, Princess has, um, is working now in correlation with Cornell University, so we can do online courses with them and it's not just cruise ship courses, like we can do something in photography or wine tasting or things like that. Like you can do a variety of courses that they offer for free uh, for us, which is really cool. Um, but also language courses. Uh, Princess is very invested well, in their crew. You, you offended them. Oh, they, don't, they don't like Cornell. They're Harvard, oh, they're they're like, Harvard that's people. A, <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. Um, but yeah, language courses, things like that, that they're offering for us um, on board. You can get Duolingo for free. If you want to do it, you can. there's a, a link to the site, so anybody, if you've got a mobile phone, even if you don't want to download the app yourself, you can use it through the website for us as crew members, and then you can learn a different language if you want to. So there's lots of stuff that you can do. It's very, very cool. Um, as well, too, uh, all crew members, we uh, so we get internet as well, but we pay. We still pay for it, yeah. but it's uh, reduced. We pay $2 a day for our internet. But then as well, you don't have to buy internet because they actually, if as long as you're connected to our crew Wi-Fi, we get, uh, it's a different, you can't find the network, but we get free WhatsApp on that as well. So we get the app, so that way we can call home and message with home and that's all free of cost, which is a, which is another little perk that we have at Princess. Yeah, it's very, very cool. This is a picture from the crew bar a couple weeks ago when it was open. Yeah. This little, no, sorry, that's the picture from Titanic when they're partying below deck. Um, keep bringing this other. This is actually our crew recreation area. So you walk in, um, that's what you see as you walk into it. It's a skinny little hallway. Uh, on the left side, that's the uh, that's the actual bar of it. Um, they put down the uh, the metal grating because uh, Karen, your assistant cruise director, will tear it down trying to get in for a drink. But they uh, they open up at six o'clock, and from there on, you can go down and enjoy a drink or two if you like. Uh, you have to drink responsibly, of course. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Hi, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> How you doing? We were just talking about you. <laughs> Karen, what time is it? It's not six o'clock yet. It's not six o'clock yet. Six o'clock club. <laughs> Only for another day. Yeah, only for another day, Karen. So uh, yeah, you go there. It's uh, we live actually uh, duty free, and uh, Princess sells it to us at below cost. So like, if you want to go have a beer after work. They only charge us like a dollar twenty-five or a dollar forty, so it's really, really cheap. So they're selling below cost. They, they, they don't make money off the crew, which is the way it should be, right? Like you know, yeah. we're here to work. They don't need to make money off us. Um, so what happens is if you go down that hallway and you turn right, you see this. Um, so this is half. So there's that wall there where the cupboards are, and then on the in the between the two guys there, you can see there's like a little round area. That's a DJ booth, and on that side it's like a nightclub. There's like a big open area, and all around the outside we have uh, big screen TVs with that PlayStation hooked up to them. So you go down and play a video game. FIFA seems to be the really popular game on board right now. Everyone kind of plays that. Um, and then of course, Lauren's favorite things. Yeah, the pool table, by the way. I know you what you're thinking. Why do they have a pool table? Why don't they have a pool table? Because a pool table is a big waste of space known to mankind on a cruise ship. <laughs> because every time the ship moves, your balls move. <laughs> so you don't have to have any skill to play a pool on a board a ship. You've just got to be standing in the right direction at the right time. And all of a sudden you hit the ball one and then make your shot and you break and then and you win. It's wonderful. Yeah. Same as the foosball tables. Uh, that wall, by the way, where the cupboards are behind the foosball table, uh, it's actually a library, so we have a whole bunch of books there so the crew can sign it out. Then on the other side of that wall, we have a whole bunch of board games, so the crew can out sign board games out. Uh, Connect Four seems to be the popular one right now. We have a giant Connect Four board, and everyone kind of plays that. That's been the, the popular game lately. Um, so it is a really nice place. And we use it for a lot of different things as well. Actually, crew members, we have to be swabbed once a week. So we have to do, uh, we have to do a COVID test once a week. So we do that down in the crew recreation area. Boy, like me, I've been swabbed twice in the last day. Yeah, well, that's because I'm leaving. So yeah. flying into Canada, I need to have a PCR test. So I was able to get that done on board. So I did my, we did our rapid test yeah. yesterday and I did a, another PCR just to double check today. So got to tickle the eyeball. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. 
Um, so we do that in there. Uh, we do meetings in there, church yeah. services, right? Church services, get togethers, gatherings. Obviously, you know, with COVID, things are different. But invariably, that is now, it's a really, it's a jack of all trade space. We, we do karaoke, we do it in there. We do it, yes, there's a game show, we do it in there. If we're going to have a trivia, we'll do it in there. If we're going to have a crew party, we'll do it in there. All, anything that you would use a normal town hall for, we, we use that area um, on a normal sort of basis. There's also a crew gym attached to it as well, so there's a crew gym for them to use that. Um, we have our own 7-Eleven, which is pretty cool, uh, so we have our own shop. It's the crew shop, you go in, everything's really, really cheap, like, I mean, like, I think a Pringles is like a dollar, like, it, it's really, really cheap. Uh, you can get everything that you need, like, you know, M&Ms and Kit Kats and uh, all the essentials, like fuzzy peaches and beef jerky and noodles. Please know, we eat like teenagers. <laughs> you know, we do. Everything you need, like Pringles and jerky and M&Ms. Um, yes. As well, though, you can get uh, different, uh, sort of looking for? Toiletries. Toiletries, thank you. <laughs> toiletries, you can get deodorant. Uh, I don't know why they call it toiletries, though. It's a stupid name. Actually, for I can tell you, but do you want the historical definition? I, I kind of do, because I always thought, like, toiletries, like, why would you take things from the toilet and put it on you? No, it's got nothing yourself. to do with the toil. It's actually the clock that they used to use in Georgian times. It was called a toil, which was French. And they would use this cast to wipe themselves down because they didn't actually bath and stuff during Jordan times. So from the toil, you would go and do your toilet, and everything from there became bathroom hygiene, became toilet. She's way too smart, isn't she? Oh my, oh my god. Okay. Or you're the best liar I've ever met. <laughs> um, so with the toiletries, though, uh, the, the problem is that they only have like one or two options of each thing. So it's like, you get these two types of soap, you get this type of deodorant. So that's why, right, in Puerto Vallarta, we all go running off the ship to Walmart. Every crew member, we take off. Because they don't stock plain salted chips. And that is a problem for me. So I send people, if I can't get off the ship, I send people with money. Chips, God, find them, bring them back. Uh, we also, like uh, Karen and I, we'll, we'll do cheese. We like to buy cheese. And then we'll we'll eat a lot of cheese and crackers and stuff, and we get all of that too. It's kind of cool. Um, this is uh, the crew mess on board. So, uh, oh yeah, but we, did we talk about? No, we kind of missed that. Uh, so there's two different areas that well, three areas that we eat. we have a, a crew mess, a staff mess, and a officers mess. Now, uh, right now the crew mess, well, the crew staff mess is the same, but they're split into two. Uh, we're keeping because again we're trying to keep everyone kind of separate. So our deck and technical crew. They all eat the crew mess, which is this right here. Uh, when you walk in, it's buffet style. They have their own pizzeria on the right side with really good pizza. And then you can see the seating area in behind. And then this is the other side there, that's the buffet side. So I just turned and took the picture. So it's very similar to World Fresh Marketplace. Um, and then as well, what we've done for the hotel uh, crew and staff, they're now eating, uh, if, you, if you haven't noticed, you're missing a dining room. The symphony dining room is oh, gone, it's yes. disappeared. We use that now for our, uh, our hotel uh, crew and staff to eat down there. This is because it's so much bigger. There's more room for them to socially distance and be safe. So, and I mean, we're there's only 25 percent of you. We can easily handle the load with uh, the two dining rooms. So, so, we're using some of the guest amenities to help to, uh, take care of the crew. This is what a crew corridor looks like. This is what our hallways look like. Um, and they're about this wide. Yeah, seriously, they are. They're like that. Each door dictates your rank on board. So, a red door is a crew member. A blue door is a uh, staff member or a petty officer, which uh, are like what? Uh, like the boutiques, like the dancers, um, our production team, youth staff, casino dealers, that kind of thing. They are like our concessions teams and things like that. They are staff. Yeah, so they have a blue door and then a white door means that you're an officer on board. So I don't know why they do it, but it just uh, yeah. kind of shows you what your rank is. I, I don't know, actually. Yeah, it, I, I have no idea. I don't know if and that's... that might be because of the levels, I don't know. I don't know if it's like a new, like if it's like an old merchant navy thing or like, no idea. There's a lot of things that carry over from from the navy that come in. Oh, sorry to offend you. He is an army guy. He's the one talking about the navy. <laughs> we are army you, I knew you were an army family. <laughs> He's a Buckeyes fan too. Oh. <laughs> okay, are you from Columbus, sir? So, oh, but you live in Ohio? I did. Do, do you want to do your mating call right now? No. Oh, wait. <laughs> they can't help it. <laughs> Good luck at Bingo, sir. I think that's where they're going to. I think that's what's happening right now. Bingo's getting ready to go. 
Yeah, that's probably what it is. All right, so uh, we're gonna show you the cabin. So if you go into a red door to a crew cabin, we actually have a picture of Lauren's original cabin uh, when she was a, a crew. Yep. So that's, that's what it looks like. This was my cabin on the Dawn Princess, um, and I lived in that cabin. Well, I lived in the cabin that looked just like that for about four years. Uh, as you can see, there's bunk beds. I had a cabin mate, and um, whoever's been there the longest gets the bottom bunk. It's reverse from when you're a child because everybody wants the top bunk when you're a kid, and now it's a case of I will take the bottom bunk. Uh, very, actually, it's it's small. I'm not going to pretend that it's a massive cabin. It's not, but we really only ever slept there. So, you know, you get up, you go to work, you go out and forth, you go to the crew bar, you come back, you go to sleep. So there's more than enough space for two people. Um, there's a cupboard on the side, we could hang up our stuff. We had the sink was in the, the cabin itself, so you had a basin, you could, uh, you know, put your toiletries away and things like that. The only thing with the red door cabins is that you have an interlocking toilet with the cabin next door. So there's two cabins that share a toilet and a shower. The sink is in your cabin itself so that you can get up and get dressed and do whatever you need to do. Um, but yeah, very comfy, very nice. Um, the staff cabins, yeah. so like the blue doors are the same. Uh, they're about the same size, they're a little bit yeah. bigger because they have their own toilet uh, or bathroom inside of the room. Yeah. So it's not like a, a big bathroom, it's a lot smaller than yours. Yeah. But uh, I mean, you can do all three things at the same time. You can be on the toilet, shaving and half in the shower. Like it's, yeah. there's, our, our, our bathrooms are small, all right? Um, but so that's uh, the staff campus, they have them in there. So they'll still share a room, but then those two people have their own uh, their own bathroom and own shower in there, rather than sharing amongst four. Um, and then after that, you move up to the officer status is when, uh, and by the way, we always, we try to promote within. So it's nice, because as you move up the ranks in each promotion, you get more and more benefits and perks that come to you. So you get, you know, bigger rooms, you get, uh, you know, more, you get cabin stewards more often in the week than, you know, as you move up yeah. and, you know, you can get different deck privileges, you can use the crew gym, and as you move up, you're just getting kind of more and more. Uh, so then you go to the officer's cabin. This is Lauren's cabin now. Yeah. Yeah, that's so that's cabin. my cabin. Um, so the great thing, of number one, it's mine. I don't share it with anybody, which is amazing. Uh, number two, that bunk bed, it is still a single bed though, which, yeah, but the bunk bed folds up into the roof, so it's not actually down. So I don't have anything about me, so it's really, it's very roomy. Um, I've got three chairs in the cabin for no particular reason because I only have one bum, but three chairs apparently is what I need. Um, I have more, st I actually have a lot of open drawers because there's a lot of storage space that I, I don't actually need. I don't bring that much stuff with me. So this is really more than I need. I can tell you that on my wish list though is a double bed and a window. That's, that's the dream. Is Does yours have a storage space under the bed as well? I've never even, I don't even open the thing, my, I don't need it, so I haven't so, looked. I don't know if your bed's the same as mine, it's a little bit bigger. The, uh, my mattress, like, I'll show you my room, that's what my room looks like. Double bed and a window. It's really the same, it's the same. It's a double bed and it's a window. It's the same. It's, it's the a same. window. It's the same it's size. The same. <laughs> it's a double bed and a window. exact same size. I don't know why everybody laughs, it's the exact same size. It's not, it's a double bed and a window, it's different. But actually what happens is, is uh, I can pull my mattress off and in behind the drawer in the middle, there's actually a little like piece of wood on my box spring. I guess it's not really a box spring because that's built in. But you can open it up and there's a big uh, void there so I can put my suitcase underneath the bed and then you close it. So then it goes away from the contract. So I had to fish that out a couple days ago to start packing. From his double bed. <laughs> and when, actually, you know what? Um, no, lie, no word of a lie though because when we were teasing Duke, the next step up for, for Kevin, if Kevin wants to, to move higher up the, the next step, because it's about as high as you can go really, is to become the entertainment director. And they get like a mini suite, which is really cool. Um, Duke's cabin is lovely. Uh, he's got a, a couch and windows, not just one, and uh, a separate bedroom with a bathroom with a full bath and everything. It's, it's really very nice. So the higher you go, like Kevin said was saying, it's really something to aspire to, especially if you start as a, you know, as a crew member, then you become Archive. a staff member, then you carry on and you you get higher. Um, it's it, it's perks that pay off after all. Yeah, and then right now Lauren's actually in for entertainment director, so uh, she's applied for that, which I think that she'll probably get. She's, uh, hey, thank you. Very qualified. Thank you. But I mean, you said like you can't go higher, but absolutely we can. We can still. Oh, you can still go up to. I'm talking about within the department. Yeah, within the yeah. department, but uh, so. You can go, so if Lauren was an entertainment director, 
Entertainment director and cruise director are both three stripe officers on board. You can go from any hotel three stripe job to becoming the associate hotel general manager who we just met, John. And then you can go from there to being the actual hotel general manager and look after the entire hotel operation. So, I mean, I don't think it's a job I'd ever want. You would probably enjoy it. Probably. <laughs> I can see you getting probably. it, being really good at it. But. Yeah, I wanna, I wanna do ED for a little bit first though and really enjoy it and get my teeth into it. And then we will see because I'm very, very I, once I've done something that I really love for a long time, then I will get a little bit bored and then I'll move on. But right. a couple of videos for you. So this up, Laura, this is your video. Okay, so this one is taken from the Pacific Pearl. Uh, she was an old yep. princess ship. Um, and that video is from the bridge, which was on deck 12. The, the deck that you're looking at is deck nine. We are sailing in the Tasman. This is not the roughest sea I have ever been in my life, but it was fun. 10 meters of onda. That's the captain speaking, by the way. The man. Wow. 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 This is from the same body of water. This is just from the pan uh, before the pandemic on the Ruby Princess. Lauren, I didn't tell you this, but last week when we did this presentation, a guest came up to me and they were they were on that this cruise with me. Right. Yeah, they were on this yeah. thing. We were talking about That's this cool. thing. Yeah, so that, that was really funny. This is deck eleven, by the way. Looking out uh, our window on deck eleven on the Ruby. You'll hear my giggle in a second. Come down. <laughs> <laughs> See, we love it. That's it the thing so on for us. We have a great time. We love it, and we love watching all our new crew members going on and share these, you know, these stories of our sage wizard. This is nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the ship's not moving. This is hardly moving. Come on. Come on. Get to work. Get to work. Um, but yeah, as long as the crew aren't worried, that's the only thing. Yeah. When you're on a ship, and if it's rough. If the crew are just continuing on, like nothing's happening, then you know you're fine, right? So that's the secret. All right, the operational pods. Talk about this very quickly. Um, I, who was at Captain Circle last night? A couple of you, yeah, our elite and platinum members. I, I talked about it kind of uh, briefly there, but it was, uh, it was a crazy, crazy time. You have to remember, uh, it was our fault, right? The pandemic was the cruise ship's industry's fault. We caused the pandemic. It was all on us. Um, it, was, it was ridiculous. And what happened was, it was actually, uh, in my opinion, incredibly disgusting. We were uh, sentenced away, uh, cruise ships, from ports. We, people stopped taking us in, and they literally left us with nowhere to go. Airport shut down, country shut down, and we were stuck on ships. Uh, Lauren, you were at home? I was at home with my mother. About to go on the ship? <laughs> uh, I was on the ship. <laughs> I, I was on the Sun Princess. But what happened was, is uh, a lot of our ships were going to do because the world was, you know, they wouldn't let us come in to use their airports. So what we did is we had our ships from the Carnival Corporation meet at sea. And we did these meetups at sea and we'd uh, move people in the lifeboats from ship to ship. And so we were like, okay, if you're from the Philippines, you're going to go jump on the Royal Princess. If you're from the UK, we're going to go put you on this Holland America ship. If you're from this country, you're going on this Carnival ship. And we moved all of our crew members around ship to ship and then started what I would imagine is the largest repatriation effort at sea because yeah, we, we, uh, I mean, the Carnival, uh, we employ, uh, what, what did you say, 100, 100, 130,000 seaborne like employees yeah. every single year, and we had to get them all home. So yeah. it was it was an incredible operation. It took about 80 days on average to get our, our crew members home. Um, really, really cool. Uh, the last one only got home about six months ago. She was uh, from Mauritius, and Mauritius locked down. They wouldn't let anybody in or out. Uh, they wouldn't let any, any incoming travel by air or by sea. Um, she was uh, a masseuse on board. Uh, on a princess ship. And so the way it works is after we got everyone home, we had to have something called minimum manning on the ship, which was about 110 people. So we'd have all of our bridge uh, officers and all of our uh, engineers. And then of course we had uh, people support them. So we had some housekeeping staff and some uh, uh, galley staff and servings, uh, servers. So it was about 110 to keep these ships going. But that one ship that had the masseuse, they were the lucky ones because they, they could still get a massage. And so she, she, she got, kept working through and we all definitely celebrated for her when she got home. That was a very uh, happy moment. But we were already back to see what she finally made at home, which was absolutely incredible, yeah. Um, my story, quickly, I told it last night. But, uh, I was on the Sun Princess. We got kicked out of Australia. 
But what happened was this princess actually did a lot of work, which this has made me really proud to work for this company, but they actually helped get me visas to get me back into the country. And uh, they took care of my quarantine in Sydney. I only had to fly to Canada, they didn't. They flew me to Australia, I did quarantine in Sydney, flew to Brisbane. But the thing was that was so exciting and that was nerve wracking is that while I was out at sea, uh, my partner was very pregnant. And so I didn't know if I was gonna make it back on time. And uh, by the time I made it back, I had 10 days to spare that my daughter was born. That's when Charlotte came into the world. So I just made it for her. And I love showing her off, as everybody knows by now. Um, so there's a picture of Charlotte uh, when we first brought her home from the hospital. She was born with all that hair. She, they thought, actually, she was a cesarean baby. And the doctor, when they first saw her, went, oh my god. I'm like, what is it? What's wrong? And they go, no, 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 sorry, there's a lot of hair. And we thought there was going to be like a monkey getting pulled out. It wasn't really, it wasn't really far off. And then. Uh, that picture on the bottom right was the beginning of August last year. That was the, uh, the, our last day together in Australia. So we haven't seen each other in uh, six months now. Um, it's been tough, you know, missing the first steps and all that stuff. We missed all that. But I should be seeing her now in a couple weeks. I'm flying to Canada first, then get down to Australia. and get, uh, get to have a cuddle with my little baby. I'm excited for that. Um, but that, that kind of brings me up to, to wrap up the presentation, and we'll take a couple questions for you. Is that, you know, I just like to always end this by saying, you know, crew members were a really weird breed. You know, it takes a weird person to sacrifice. You know, we miss everything. We miss every all of us. We miss first steps. We miss weddings. We miss funerals. We miss birthdays. We miss Christmas. We we miss all of it. And we give it all up because we want to create memories for other people, which is a really weird mindset to want to do that. But that's what we love and what we live for. Because at the end of the day, you know, like Val, the bartender, he hopes that you know, two or three years from now, you'll be sitting down talking to each other and go. What was that bartender's name that was so amazing? We found, oh, that's it, found. Oh, I wonder how he's doing these days. And that's what we all live for. We live to make sure that you guys have the memories because that's, that's what you deserve. And we're so excited to be serving in hospitality. We love sacrificing our lives for you. But the reason why I say this, just today on your final day, when you walk around the ship and there's a crew member that did something nice for you, say thank you to them. You have no clue how little we hear that. Just say thank you to a crew member and it's gonna make their day, for, well, make their month. Um, it means a lot, so you know, definitely uh, share that with them. Share the words. Have they taken care of you this week yet, yeah, the crew? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Let me say one. Two questions each. Yeah, let's see some questions. Two questions each, and then we'll all wrap it up. So we got one, two. Phil's got a question. I was talking about you, Phil. Okay, the, the first question is what do we do if there's a medical emergency and somebody has to be medically disembarked? Very simply, we medically disembark them. Um, and I know, I, I'm not trying to be obnoxious or anything, but uh, that is our number one priority, is the safety of everybody on board the ship. So if there is something, if it can wait until port and it's not life-threatening, then we will get them off, we contact local, we use our port flying over, the ship will pause, we will get the helicopter, they'll send a winchman down, they'll grab the person, winch them up, and off we go. Um, same thing if there is a ship in distress, we, if we are in the reach of a ship in distress, it doesn't matter how far away we are, if we can go and help people, we will do that. And we have, I've been in a few occasions where we've gone and rescued people, um, either someone shipwrecked or somebody was an idiot in Alaska and decided to go out into sea in a storm and then he and his dog had to get rescued. Things like that, we, we do that all the time. Refugees, depending Refugee. on where you're sailing in the world, so that you have to provide a, a help to them, yeah. but it depends on where you are, what you do with them. Um, but yeah, yeah. there's, there's uh, tons, tons of different things. But there's a whole system in place for getting with helicopter evacuations and things like that. Um, we shut down one side of the ship, move all the guests. It doesn't matter if it's one o'clock in the morning, you will get up, you will evacuate your cabin. You will go and sit in the theater, for example, and we will do a helicopter evacuation. And people just accept it because if it was your mom or dad who needed the same medical treatment, you would find somebody to get up out of their bed and move for you. So yeah. 100% we get them. I had a great question. It was uh, uniforms on board. What happens with uniforms? So uh, the way it works is that uh, every crew member is provided their first set of uniforms for free. Uh, after that, if you need to do something with them, then it, there's a small, like, but like the, the crew staff, like for example, they wear those gray suits. That's their uniform on, I only make them wear them on turnaround day. But uh, the gray suits, it's like, I think it's like $12 for like the jacket. Like, it's all really cheap. It's again, below cost. Um, and then as well, galley staff, they actually put they put in their uniforms every yeah. day, don't they? So yeah. it's that's not like, that's not their shirt, right? No. So like what happens is they put out their shirt at the end of the night, and laundry will come by and put on a brand new well not a brand new one but a cleaned one 
onto their door, and then they take the old one, and then they just keep getting the uniforms delivered to them. Uh, us, actually, we have the, uh, the worst deal on board because we wear our own clothes. So as you know, every night I'm in a suit on stage. Those are all my suits, and I do not get reimbursed for them. So uh, being a cruise director or assistant cruise director on board is actually there's an pretty added expensive. expense. It can be pretty, pretty expensive, especially if you like shoes. It can get very, very expensive. So very uh, that was, that's a great ahead. question, though. Thank you for that one up top. A uh, gentleman at the back asks us, how, we've got 18 decks above, how many decks below? Uh, we have, they are, we're on deck four is water level, so three, two, and one. And zero. Zero would be and the bilge. Zero right? is tank bilge. Tank. What do you call it? What's the name for the, the, the bilge tank top? No, tank yeah. tops. Phil doesn't know. Phil doesn't know. It's three decks. Am I just making it up? There's, there's no three zero? decks, but the deck Not that you know of. size is a, a bit bigger because of the engines. So the, the deck one is is quite cavernous, really. Um, and then we'll have deck two where there's living accommodation three. And then four, there's more. Uh, there's living four's water three level. And four's water level. And then from there on up, it, it goes up from there. Yeah, that's where Phil is. Phil's down on deck number four. We're above water level. We're, we're higher than Phil. Yeah, no, but deck zero, he says it's not there, but that's a great spot. That's where I've been smuggling the drugs for the last couple weeks. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know that's why. See, Phil, he's he's got different. You know, as I was saying earlier, if you say you know you have a, a window and a double bed, that's that's an attractive thing. Will's like, or Phil, Phil, Will, <laughs> Phil, he's got a double bed, a window, and handcuffs. So they, they have, he's very popular on board. Can I? So fun story. I tried to bring handcuffs on board once because we were doing a country and western one. Yeah, sure. So it was for a theme thing, right? And uh -huh. security stopped me because I had. They were the plastic handcuffs. So security stopped me, and in front of all the guests, they pulled this lot up, and I was like, and like what are you gonna do with these? And I was like, it's a theme night. And they're like, you cannot bring these on board. And I said, well, what? like, not trying to be funny, but can you explain to me why not? And the explanation that I got, and I loved it, because it was my favorite thing I've ever heard. They said, bearing in mind, these are auto-release handcuffs. There's no key, all right? They were, they the kids won't. They said, if you handcuff somebody to the bed and the ship sinks, you might leave them there. <laughs> like, what bedpost, number one, you've seen my cabin. What bedpost am I handcuffing anybody to? And what kind of a human being would it be that I'm like, oh, ship sinking. <laughs> you weren't that good anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's a perfect way to wrap it up, everybody. Thank you for coming, and uh, we'll see you guys. Okay, bye.